After, pub after publishing a second monograph in 2014, I really wanted a change of scene. Almost by chance, I was invited to be part of a group working in Jerusalem on diagrams and maps and how they helped visualize knowledge in the Middle Ages and early modern periods. Oh dear. I decided to explore whether Byzantine opus sectile, cut stone pavements, might be diagramming some kind of knowledge, given their visual similarity to some diagrams in books. I spent a year working on these floors without being able to prove that hypothesis, which was frustrating. Perhaps my most important insight was that basic work on Byzantine diagrams still needed to be done. Specialists had touched on the topic, of course, especially scholars working in Byzantine sciences, but no one had tried to look at Byzantine diagrams as a whole. In the book that emerged from the Jerusalem Working Group, I published an overview of the corpus, a, pro a prolegomenon to Byzantine diagrams, showing the wide range of fields in which diagrams appear and also where they don't appear. For example, as far as I know, there are no Byzantine diagrams that show extensive genealogies or histories, unlike their abundant use in medieval European manuscripts. Unfortunately, my chapter was the only treatment of Byzantine diagrams in a book of over 500 pages. In 2018, I co-organized the annual Dumbarton Oaks Symposium on the topic of Byzantine, European, and Islamic diagrams, and by the way, Islamic diagrams are just as neglected as Byzantine ones. The book that resulted from that conference is in press right now. It has papers, as you see, on Byzantine musical, astronomical, cosmological, and medical diagrams, as well as my own essay on theological diagrams. I hope the Dumbarton Oaks book will stimulate much more work in the field. I'll take this opportunity to promote another book with which I was not involved at all, The Companion to Byzantine Science, edited by Stavros Lazarus and published in 2020. It contains some excellent essays that touch on diagrams in the Byzantine sciences. The bottom line is that there were quite a lot of diagrams in Byzantine manuscripts, and they're not hard to find if you're looking for them. The challenge is that they're not recorded in resources like the Pinakes database or such earlier resources as the 12 volume catalog of Greek astrological manuscripts, which focus on identifying texts. The Greek word diagramma means something marked out by lines and linear diagrams accompany a diverse range of Byzantine texts, especially those related to the quadrivium. These linear diagrams, diagrammata in the plural, but also called schemata or cartographes, are easily recognized. They may have data organized in columns or rows, or in simple geometric shapes with a few or many lines. I'm showing some examples on the left. Sometimes diagrams are more complex, with many words and even images, but still organized with lines. We can call these imagistic diagrams. We can even stretch the term diagram to include pictorial images that evoke diagrams in the way they are organized, often in concentric circles or hierarchical registers, like the examples on the right. I'll call these diagrammatic images. This is not a hard and fast typology, just a way of indicating the continuum and variety of diagrams in Byzantine manuscripts. In all of these cases, the diagrammatic form demonstrates relationships among component parts. What distinguishes them from decorative patterns made up of lines is precisely this practical function, diagram structure and order information that is usually found in an accompanying text. They present it economically, and make it more memorable by giving it a linear or geometric or even a pictorial form. So diagrams in manuscripts are easy to recognize, even if they're not necessarily easy to describe. 
In the next half hour or so, I want to consider whether the Byzantines had diagrams outside of manuscripts and not accompanied by extensive texts. I will propose that both actual diagrams and abstract ways of thinking diagrammatically, that is in linear and geometrical terms in three dimensions and not just two, were part of the Byzantine visual landscape and more widespread than has been noticed previously. I will also argue that this diagrammatic mode played a role in public life, helping to structure the Byzantines' understanding of time and space. I suggest that diagrams in two and three dimensions could work like the more familiar ones in manuscripts to demonstrate harmonious relationships and reify taxis order. My talk is divided into two parts, diagrammatic time and diagrammatic space. Let's start with the first. One of the principal Byzantine indications of taxis order was the orderly passage of time, cosmic time, dynastic and regnal time, and the civic and liturgical calendars from whole seasons to the hours of the day. Keeping track of time in the public sphere often required diagrammatic organization, effected by means of lines on mechanical clocks and sundials, both known as horologia, and also on shadow tables or horopodia. As Benjamin Anderson has discussed, Constantinople had at least four monumental mechanical clocks. A seventh century one reportedly counted the day by means of a clever dial and a dark engraving. This dial and engraving were almost certainly linear and therefore diagrammatic. Sundials could be fixed or portable. Several of the fixed type are still preserved on the sunny south facing exterior of Byzantine and post Byzantine churches. At the Chemesis church in Skripu, 10 Greek letters mark the hours, and the equal divisions of the semicircle imply that the length of the hours is always the same. Sundials are publicly visible abstractions of time. The geometric presentation at Skripu was supplemented by figural means with peacocks in the corners as symbols of immortality, but this is unusual. The oldest Byzantine portable sundials date to the late fifth or sixth century. An example now in London had a gnomon or pointer that indicated one of 16 cities and provinces named in a semicircle, including Constantinople. Months and days are arrayed along the edge of the dial and a separate circle contains symbols of the seven planets that control each day of the week. Turning a lever each day engaged a gear mechanism that told the date in both the solar and lunar calendars. Portable sundials were convenient temporal diagrams, probably visible to a small audience. Sundials are occasionally depicted in manuscripts as on the upper left. In this 12th century monastic psalter from Mount Athos, the sundial page on the recto has on its verso a decorative shadow table. Such a horopodion diagram shows the length of one's shadow throughout the day with the standing person as the pointer. Because shadow length varied at different times of the day and from month to month, the chart helped a reader determine the canonical hours of prayer. What's important for me is that some late Byzantine astrological compendia refer explicitly to the presence of horopodia, not in books, but on walls. Some early Byzantine examples survive, like this sixth century example in Latin from Byzantine Tunisia. A rather unusual one was once painted in Greek on the north interior wall of a chapel at Bawit in Egypt in the seventh or eighth century. It recorded the length of a shadow only at noon on the first and 15th days of each month. Alain de Lacre, who studied it, concluded that the gnomon was a tall structure or a meridian line south of the chapel. 
The practical function of the Bawit diagram is limited. It only tells the viewer about midday, but presumably it served a mnemonic function, reminding its user of an activity, perhaps a liturgical one, repeated at that time. There must have been more such shadow diagrams painted on Byzantine walls that have since been lost. Among their other functions, astrolabes could also be used to tell time. The only preserved Byzantine astrolabe made in 1062 resembles the portable sundial. It is clearly diagrammatic with straight and curving lines marking the hours. Rare confirmation of the actual use of an astrolabe is found in several late Byzantine manuscripts. Divna Manolova, who is doing some terrific work on Byzantine scientific diagrams now, identified a reference to using an astrolabe to tell time in a philosophical dialogue by Nikephoros Gregoras. The protagonist remarks that determining the time is a starting point from which a person can expand his knowledge. A monk is shown holding one, holding an astrolabe in the mid 14th century Constantinopolitan manuscript on the right. His audience is limited to a single seated monk, but I think we can imagine small group audiences for the use of such diagrammatic devices. Byzantine astronomy was certainly a very specialized field, but it also had a practical application in astrology because movements in the heavens were understood to affect civic and personal life on earth. Individual horoscopes are preserved in manuscripts, but patriographic texts from the eighth to the 10th century refer to astrological installations at sites across Constantinople. At the Xerolophos, the form of Theodosius, there was a horoscope on three feet and an astronomical installation which encompasses 36 years. Under the iconoclast Emperor Leo III, quote, many ancient horoscopes, thematia, were destroyed, including the quadrant of the zodiac, where, quote, many people used to perform astronomical calculations, unquote. A thematian is a diagram of celestial data at a specific time. Now, it's impossible to know the precise form of these Constantinopolitan thematia, but it seems likely that they were elaborate sundials with the planets and zodiac marked. And the calculations were evidently done in public. We should perhaps imagine something like the meridian in the late first century BCE pavement of the Campus Martius at Rome. A north-south line in gilded bronze represented the year. Small perpendicular lines marked the 360 degrees of the zodiac. And zodiac signs and information about the seasons were inscribed in Greek. The meridian measured the passage of the solar year as the sun moved through the zodiac. And such a public meridian may have helped diagram time passing in New Rome as well. There was at least one monumental zodiac diagram in Constantinople, still extant, I hope, in the early 12th century pavement of the Pantocrator Monastery Catholicon. This opus sectile zodiac wheel divides the signs into groups of three, separated by images of the four seasons. It is a diagram of the orderly cosmos, reinforced by figural images of the seasons, hunting, and farming elsewhere in the pavement. Zodiac imagery presented in a circular format was widespread in the early Byzantine Eastern Mediterranean, and examples are also preserved in several post-Byzantine churches. At a church in the Mani, Concentric circles contain Christ at the center, then angels with zodiac signs in the outer ring. And at a church at Milias in the Pelion Peninsula, the central figure of Kronos is encircled by seasons, the zodiac, and the wheel of time or fortune. 
such hierarchical nested circles are definitely diagrammatic. They show at a glance that Christ or time is the locus from which the heavens and earth unfurl in an orderly fashion. One of, <clears throat> one of the clearest ways to systematize material is in the form of registers or lists, grids, and tables. Tables for calculating time, especially the dates of Easter and other movable feasts, which were based on the lunar cycle, were included in many kinds of Byzantine manuscripts. But such paschal tables, pascalia, were also painted more visibly on church walls. Examples survive from across the Byzantine millennium. There's one in Coptic in the nave of the Red Monastery in Egypt, probably sixth century, and in the narthex of Hagios Demetrios in Thessaloniki, which dates between 1473-4 and 1492-3, when the church became a mosque. The monumental table in Thessaloniki records movable feasts until the Byzantine year 7000, when the Byzantines thought the world would end and there was no point in calculating further. Later tables acknowledge that time did continue beyond that year. In the 16th century, a table of movable feasts was painted next to an entrance into the Catholicon of the Vlachadon Monastery in Thessaloniki. Reckoning time, sacred time, in memorably diagrammatic form, and at a large scale, probably helped create the impression of civic and institutional order and stability. The passing of sacred time could also be communicated by presenting figural imagery in grid form. For instance, the life of St. Euphemia is depicted in the late 13th century frescoes in her church adjacent to the Hippodrome in Constantinople. Viewers must have been conditioned to read the images in horizontal registers from left to right across the top row and then the second one, rather than from top to bottom in columns, even though the thick vertical point painted frames and the thin horizontal ones might suggest the opposite. Vita icons also use a grid format which makes the viewer see each episode independently, compartmentalized in a grid, but at the same time as part of a continuous whole with one frame following another. In calendar icons, the repetition of figures in small units communicates that the saints or events are of equal importance and that Christian time is unspooling in a rhythmic orderly manner. This diagrammatic presentation of sacred time in grid form is complicated by works like this 12th century steatite icon in Toronto. Here, the preserved male and female monastic saints are not arranged in calendar order, as we might expect. They must have been chosen for inclusion on a different basis, perhaps personal preference. But even here, the diagrammatic conception implicit in the grid gives the impression of order despite calendrical irregularity. That said, it is difficult to understand why the grid form was used for the dedicatory inscription on the right from the outskirts of Constantinople. Commemorating a ktitor named uh, Poulos, the text is presented in the form of a six by six grid with one or several letters in each compartment. The format makes reading the words more difficult and it does not facilitate recall, which is the goal of most grids and of diagrams in general. Perhaps in this case, the grid was meant to elevate the text imposing a format that was familiar from important seeming tables or charts like the ones I've just discussed. And by the way, since I'm speaking about time, the few publications of this plaque 
date it to the Byzantine year 6021, which is our year 512 or 513, but the carver clearly left out a digit. The minuscule letters and the ligatures here absolutely preclude a date in the early sixth century. So it, could, it dates to somewhere in the 13th or 14th century. I'll conclude this section on time with the only genealogical relationship that is regularly presented in diagrammatic form in the Byzantine world. The tree of Jesse first appeared in manuscripts as a simple stemma branching from the top down along the female line. Later visualizations have the more familiar tree form with Jesse, the father of King David at the base. From his loins sprouts a sturdy trunk that leads up through the male ancestors of Christ, culminating in the Theotokos or Christ himself. The oldest monumental example that survives from the Byzantine world is on the exterior of the Panagia Mavriotisa at Castoria, painted around 1260, and perhaps contemporary with its depiction in the cloister of the Perivleptos Monastery in Constantinople. The tree of Jesse seems to have developed alongside diagrammatic images of the Komnenian imperial line, as you can see at the Mavriotista, Michael VIII Paleologos was shown to the left of the tree next to a Komnenian emperor, suggesting a dynastic continuity, but a false one, parallel to that of Christ. The tree of Jesse continued in the Paleologan period and was also adapted to depict the line of succession in the Serbian kingdom and empire. Diagrammatic images like these made public arguments about legitimacy manifested over time. The second part of my talk today is about diagrammatic space. So far, I've proposed that grids can suggest the passage of time, but they can also indicate a hierarchy of space. On the sliding lid of the 10th century Limburg Starothiki, for example, the enthroned Christ is at the center of a three by three grid. It is immediately clear that the other eight compartments revolve around the central core, as it were. The same spatial hierarchy is apparent in Byzantine cross and square and other centrally planned churches, where the central bay supports the dome and in turn is supported by the lower vaults. As is well known from surviving decorative programs and ekphrases, the decorative scheme of such spaces was also hierarchical, with the most sacred images closest to the dome that represents heaven with Christ at the center. In her recent book, Yelena Bogdanovich asserted that the grid-like cross in square church was an assemblage of modular, essentially cubic parts that, quote, reveal the diagrammatic reasoning behind their creation, unquote. She notes that such diagrammatic design was not only a practical strategy, but also a carrier of architectural knowledge. The orderly presentation of figures in stratified sacred space was adopted across the Byzantine world, from Southern Italy to Cappadocia and it was probably the most widely recognized instantiation of three-dimensional diagrammatic taxis. Henry Maguire and Cecily Hillsdale have both observed that imperial imagery in Byzantine manuscripts is often diagrammatic, following a clear geometric layout that makes the images immediately comprehensible as what Maguire called icons of power. We can see this very clearly at the upper left in the pseudo Dionysius manuscript sent to Saint Denis in the early 15th century. Repeated triangles reveal the divine and family hierarchies, even if they're not drawn in as I've done here. The same is true for imperial imagery outside of manuscripts. On the front of the Byzantine crown sent to Hungary around 1074, 
Christ is the apex of a triangle with the archangels Michael and Gabriel in the lower corners. On the back, Emperor Michael VII Dukas presides over his son Constantine and King Geza I of Hungary. The same composition was often used in ivories and in wall decoration, as in the examples I'm showing here. In both of these, the three heads form one triangle, and the imperial hands created an additional horizontal base for the triangle of Christ's head and torso. I think these triangular schemata were so widespread in Byzantine portable and monumental arts that they were immediately perceived as hierarchical diagrams, even if the connecting lines were not drawn in and this terminology was not explicitly used. Linear and imagistic diagrams sometimes accompanied discussions of theological concepts in Byzantine manuscripts, as my essay in the Dumbarton Oaks volume will show. But on church walls and in icons, diagrammatic images were preferred. For example, the hypostases of the Trinity are shown as three figures decreasing in size in a narthex vault at Panagia Kumbelidiki in Castoria and elsewhere. As has often been noted, the three angels seated around the table in the Philoxenia scene, often called the Old Testament Trinity, are organized with triangles and circles, even if those geometric lines are implied rather than painted. Concentric circles structured the biblical garden of St. Anna in an early 14th century ekphrasis by Theodore Hyperkakinos. The ekphrasis presumably made sense to listeners or readers because it had something in common with actual Byzantine gardens. The author evoked a space ringed with cypress topiaries and enclosed in a circular wall. Fruit trees were evenly spaced inside rings and terraced around a central pool. A 14th century allegorical poem by Theodore Melitiniotes also describes a garden planted in circles. Now, in the absence of any excavated Byzantine gardens, this diagrammatic arrangement cannot be confirmed, but the literary text suggests that the presence of circular patterns in the landscape or at least a habit of thinking in such patterns. Given that late Byzantine manuscripts diagram the cosmos as a series of geocentric nested circles, the form of these gardens further suggests that they could have been understood as microcosms of the Byzantine universe. Some inlaid pavements definitely constituted spatial diagrams. At Hagia Sophia, the four strips of green marble in the naus indicated liturgical stopping points. Archbishop Simeon of Thessaloniki referred to chalk lines in other churches that helped organize Episcopal consecrations or marked places where an officiant paused to venerate an image. Discs made of porphyry set into the floor of Hagia Sophia also diagrammed stopping points. In one 13th century manuscript image, a Hodigetria icon is displayed at a spot marked by a porphyry disc in the floor. As I said at the beginning, I had hoped to find evidence that the Byzantines understood more complex inlay patterns as diagrams of cosmic harmony something like the 13th century pavement in Westminster Abbey with its explanatory inscription. But so far, this hypothesis lacks textual confirmation. I want to say just a few words about two kinds of specialized spatial diagrams that were certainly available outside of books, architectural plans and maps. As Robert Osterhout discussed in his Master Builders of Byzantium, portable plans seem to have been used in the early Byzantine centuries, but after that they disappear from the textual record. Yet diagrams were certainly produced at building sites, 
were li where lines were marked out on the on the ground with ropes or chalk. <laughs> Diagrams are fleeting, covered by the eventual building, erased by landmarks. But a basilica plan sketched on a brick, seen here on the left, and a few inscribed lines confirm the practice of diagramming at building sites between the 6th and 11th centuries. Turning to maps, it seems that the Romans' precise system of land measurement, centuriation, was not maintained in the Byzantine world. But less accurate spatial mapping was done using ropes or sharpened instruments. And Fabio Acerbi argues that all parcels of land were conceptualized as quadrilateral. Some maps survive in manuscripts, and the famous Madaba map attests to the possibility of monumental public mapping of in the mid sixth century Byzantine period. We know that Emperor Theodosius II had a large painted map of the world commissioned and displayed displayed somewhere in Constantinople in 435. There is no doubt that maps circulated in Byzantium for military, administrative, and other purposes. Michael Selos taught geography in the 11th century using a geographikon pinakion, although we have no idea what it looked like. Two centuries later, Manuel Holobolos refers to celestial or armillary spheres made of wicker, and also to drawings that he says can easily be turned, which may mean that they were not bound in a codex. At the end of the 13th century, Maximus Planudes explicitly states that one can construct a diagram of geography, a diagram of geographias, on a sphere with a 10 foot di diameter or on a planar surface 17 feet long. Now, whether he actually produced such a monumental grid or map is unknown. Finally, we should not ignore the potential for abstract mental mapping by non-specialists. In Constantinople, major statues, buildings, and inscriptions defined commemorative, protective, or transportation routes that endured over centuries. Such topoi marked onto street patterns, excuse me, mapped onto street patterns, help diagram space even without a map. As Leslie Brubaker has said, processions establish power relationships and communal identity. I would say that they help diagram those things. And even when individuals were not part of an organized procession or other group, they found their way around by following a mental diagram. On a more intimate scale, the ceremonial instructions in the, in the Pantocrator Monastery Typicon are so detailed that, as Nicoletta Isar wrote, one could almost draw a chart of the position on the ground of each participant. Now, I'm not suggesting that maps or diagrams were actually drawn to assign positions during ceremonies and processions, but rather that knowing one's proper place called for diagrammatic thinking. To conclude, I hope to have shown that just as the Byzantines had more diagrams in books than we may have realized, there were also more geometrical and diagram-like things in the Byzantine landscape than have been recognized previously. These diagrams, or things that resemble diagrams, help structure daily, liturgical, sacred, and cosmic time in the Byzantine world outside of books. Many of the diagrams concerned with time required specialized knowledge. Only a literate few could read a shadow table or a Pascal table on a wall, let alone an astrolabe. But those temporal charts could have been read aloud and the astrological calculations 
were said to have been performed publicly. Spatial diagrams were more available to non-specialists, to churchgoers, monks, and city dwellers. These are more difficult to recognize because they required a kind of abstract diagrammatic literacy, a heuristic that encouraged viewers to recognize the harmony implied by circular forms and the hierarchy implicit in triangular compositions and para pyramidal decorative schemes. I also posited that pavement designs and urban landmarks could help reify knowledge about liturgical and processional performances. These shapes and arrangements fixed sacred, imperial, and everyday figures in hierarchical space, or in other words, in diagrammatic space, produces meaning. Diagrammatic formulations were tools for relating things across time and space. Geometric schema, schemata in both two and three dimensions and with and without explicit lines helped encode and make memorable different kinds of knowledge from the dates of Easter to the roots of processions. In this way, diagrammatic thinking both manifested and reinforced the sense of order that governed the Byzantine secular and spiritual lives. Whether practical or performative, the diagrammatic mode created an impression of taxis, even when it was weak or absent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Safran. It was a very interesting topic. Uh, I have myself a few questions, but later on the questions Q&A session will be navigated uh, by my colleague, Luca Zavagno. Um, it was a very comprehensive topic, as far as I understand. It has so many layers. Uh, first of all, the uh, diagrams in time and space, altogether two different uh, <laughs> um, realms as well. Um, is it possible that the uh, space diagrams uh, also have some apotropoic functions or is there any kind of connection with ancient Egyptian, uh, ancient Egypt or what could be the guidebooks if there are uh, existing ones? Um, so uh, what do we know more about the uh, space diagrams or diagrams in spaces? Because it's a very interesting part. Well. Like, like diagrams that I think have not been recognized enough, I think apotropaea are also in that category. I think they were omnipresent, not just for the Byzantines. Uh, and so, of course, as Henry Maguire showed long ago, concentric circles have a, an association with mirrors and therefore an apotropaic function. So I, I believe that the, the concentric circle form of some of the, the, the garden and the, the um, uh, zodiac pavement that you can see on the screen right now, I think that that is something connected to their, let's say, more scientific uh, uh, meaning. So they are mutually reinforcing. They're not, they're not separate. As far as the, if, if you were asking about the textual sources for knowledge of uh, apotropaea, I mean, they are, uh, that, that's taking me a little bit out of my comfort zone, but there are many references in, in Byzantine and more widely medieval texts uh, in, in Greek, Hebrew, Latin to protective devices. And I think there is a, a common tradition of certain forms being protective, most notably the concentric uh, circles. You, you find them in all kinds of, of texts, and I'm sure one found them in, in people's talking to each other. They, they wore devices, they, they had them in their homes. Uh, we see those circles also painted on church walls, and, and I, I like the cross, they had a, a protective functionality. Um, I'm not sure that they could be called spatial diagrams, but many of them had a diagrammatic form. 
Did that did that answer your question sufficiently? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I I don't think I would go so far as to say there was uh, knowledge of anything um, uh, any Egyptian. Uh, visual language outside of Egypt itself. Um, sure, the monks in the Red Monastery at Sohag may have seen some, some yeah. things that were Egyptian, but I the, 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 the ancient texts, the Gnostic texts, they, yeah. they, they go through um, translation uh, into, uh, into Hebrew, Greek, and, and Latin, and of course, Arabic. Yeah. that uh, would have made them much more accessible than any any uh, Egyptian uh, Absolutely, writing. Gnostics uh, especially. It, it was wonderful. The topic was very extensive and I recognize the use of ligatures, extensive use of ligatures on the panels. And also there are examples of uh, post-Byzantine panels uh, using the Greek format you have just uh, shown us from the uh, Center of Femia, uh, 13th century example. And interestingly, from left to right, Greek compartments made for the Vita icons also during the post-Byzantine times. It was, uh, it was a wonderful topic. Thank you very much. It was all from my side. So uh, the floor is yours, dear Luca. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Janoja. Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll join Sir Janoja in praising the, this wonderful talk. So the floor is open to questions. You can even post the question on the chat or deliver that. I see Divina Manolova and then John Osborne. Hi, Divina. Yes. Hi, hi Linda. Um, I'm so happy I can be here and I want to apologize for not using the camera earlier. I have a cold, as you may hear, so I'm not camera ready, but I'm very <laughs> grateful to see you and thank you for the good words uh, you said about my work, but also for promoting those two recent books, which I, I think are actually very important for, for our teaching, but also for moving the field forward. And I have two questions. One, which is like a more you know specialist. I want to use your presence being here to ask your opinion about something, and then a larger one. So the the narrow one is um, refers to what you said at the very beginning, which I actually I agree with. When you quote the instruments, sundials and astrolabes, astrolabes, I think you call them temporal diagrams. So I want to ask you about an idea I've been thinking about recently, based on examples from other cultures. Do you think we can? we can use the diagrams we have in manuscripts to think about paper instruments. Because I've been trying to reconcile you know, this fact that we don't have so many instruments from the Byzantine period. Like you said, we had this early, we have eight early sundials and we have like one and a half astrolabes or so, I've, but we do have a lot of depictions of the astrolabe parts, especially in the later period in manuscripts. And I thought, I mean, can we can we think about paper instruments if they existed? And the more general question, I think, is something probably you thought about for a long time. So I, I suppose when you work on this, uh, it happened to me at least, that you start seeing the diagrams everywhere. And um, so I'm curious during all these years of your, uh, of your project and research, how did your working definition of what a diagram is change? because I, I suppose it did. Okay, two great questions there. Um, the first one about paper instruments by which you must mean parchment, uh, since paper Both. comes in fairly late. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I cited uh, Holobolos at the end using a diagram that could be turned. Mm. So presumably a large piece of something, parchment, or in his time, it could have been paper that was, I think, not bound uh, in, a, in a book format. But as you, as you intimate without actually saying it, even things bound in a codex form could be used as an instrument. One could imagine a monastic psalter with a shadow table opened up and with somebody standing in front of it serving as a gnomon, as a, a pointer um, for a fairly limited purpose. But but uh, yes, I, I Divna has pointed out a very important oddity, but unfortunately one that affects lots of Byzantine material and visual culture, which is that we just don't have, have as much surviving material as we would like. 
if we have treatises on astrolabes, why is there only one Byzantine astrolabe from centuries before those, those treatises? So could diagrams in books have been used functionally? I want to say yes. I, I'm convinced that they could have been, but part of that conviction comes from my own research history. I once uh, did an article with a co-author about how inlaid bronze bowls could have been used functionally, how they had to be manipulated and not just set on a table as, as a table decoration, let's say. So I'm very inclined to the idea that uh, yes, even things in the codex form may have served practical functions. And I do think that what distinguishes a diagram is their practical function. Uh, Divna also asked the question, and let me say Divna Manilova, I want people who are listening to know her name if they do not know already, because she is doing really fantastic work on scientific di diagrams broadly defined in Byzantium. She also asked if my definition of a diagram had changed over time. And yes, that is absolutely the case. I think like most people, I imagine diagrams as I would say Euclidean diagrams as things in the margins of texts that had lines and maybe a couple of letters. And that at the bottom line is the definition of a, uh, a, a, an ancient and then a medieval diagram. But I came to understand that there were not only lots more diagrams, but also lots more, many more kinds of diagrams. Uh, the theological diagrams I worked on do not look like the mathematical ones. But then uh, after spending a year with people who were thinking very hard about how diagrams and maps communicated knowledge and information, uh, I, I started to wonder about a, a broader arena for diagrams. And that's what made me um, speak some years ago in a preliminary way at a small Canadian conference. And then today only for the second time about diagrams in the landscape as it were, and think that why couldn't a diagram be in three dimensions rather than two? And aren't the repetitive patterns we see in, uh, let's say Byzantine wall painting and vault um, uh, structures, uh, aren't they really diagrammatic? And what kinds of knowledge might they be communicating to their users and viewers. So uh, yes, I, I'd like to think that that my ideas evolved over time. I hope most people's do. Um, but it's quite possible that I've gone too far. It may be like, as Divna joked, that once you're looking for diagrams, you see them everywhere. And I think that is a, um, you know, a scholarly uh, problem <laughs> that that perhaps is is shared by many listeners. Uh, when you're looking for something, you find it. If you're not looking for it, you don't even notice. But I guess my position on these, uh, the diagrammatic mode is that people were so attuned to these geometries uh, that they didn't have to say, oh, that I'm looking at what's on screen now, uh, that imperial panel in Hagia Sophia, that's a triangle. They, they sort of recognize the hierarchy without having to put it into words. And if I could just add one more thing, um, research was just published um, uh, nine days ago. I read about this research with baboons. Uh, it was a large scale study that showed that humans recognize geometric shapes. And this was a study from Namibians who had no formal education to French college students. Uh, so across a large range of educational background and geography, one of the things that may make us human is the ability to recognize geometric forms, which, uh, you know, I actually have a slide if I can go forward here. I thought of including this. Baboons can recognize an apple among an array of watermelon slices, but they cannot recognize geometric shapes. And so this research is suggesting that this may even be an innate human trait. And one hates to talk about that in a scholarly forum, right? We, we know the Byzantines were not exactly like the, the let's say, the, the Latins. 
in, in the Middle Ages, but there are some things that are, are human. And this research suddenly appeared on my, my New York Times feed. So I thought I might share it. So I probably said more than I needed to, um, but uh, I hope that addressed Divna's questions sufficiently. Thank you, Linda. And uh, if I can add to your last slide, I think we are also the only mammals who recognize music. So there is something about patterning there as well. Good. So I think the Byzantines were human. There's, there's the yeah. bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, John Osborne. Hello, John. Hello, Linda. Thank you for a really wonderful talk. Um, so much new information for me. Um, I know that uh, the Byzantines were uh, very innovative in terms of the organization and communication of knowledge. I'm thinking primarily of manuscripts uh, where image word relationships on a page or something in which they do amazing new things, the Kludov Psalter and so on. So my question is that uh, it relates to the fact that a number of the things you showed seem to go back into late antiquity. So how much of this diagrammatic mode that you talk about is an inheritance that is simply carried on without a break? And what, if anything, is newly created, newly thought about in, in the Middle Ages? That is a terrific and difficult question to answer. Uh, clearly, the inheritance is alive and well, and there is considerable access to the late antique uh, manuscripts in uh, in later in middle and, and late Byzantine times, uh, and yet we don't find, um, for instance, the the brief information I gave about the maps and uh, the the diagrams and spheres created to uh, by late Byzantine uh, intellectuals. Uh, to, to think about the cosmos. We think that there was continuity, but it cannot be traced. You know, T Ptolemy's map, it, it appears, it's, it's found, it's recognized suddenly in, in the late Byzantine period. Was it available before? Did anybody notice it in, in a codex before? Uh, we, we, don't, we don't know. Uh, there's a, you know, the Byzantines have a bad reputation for coasting on their, their ancient uh, heritage and not being innovative. But I think in, in many fields, the, the post late antique Byzantine world does innovate, certainly in the theological diagrams that, that I worked with and that um, you'll be able to read about soon. Uh, the issues they're dealing with comparing uh, Byzantine understandings of the of, of the Trinity uh, to Western European ones, that's something that was not developed, not articulated, and certainly not diagrammed in in the early Byzantine or late antique period. So I I, I guess the safest thing to say, and it it's, might be a cop-out, is that there are certain areas of knowledge that did make progress, no doubt, in, in Byzantium. Uh, we wish we had more material evidence uh, for it, uh, but some things absolutely uh, go back to uh, late antiquity. But that said, even the texts from late antiquity, the manuscript texts, often will have glosses, scolia in the margins that show that they are being read and being thought about and sometimes being corrected in the, the late period. Also, I, I would be ne neglectful if I didn't say that the Byzantines learned from the Islamicate world. And so um, Alexander Roberts has an excellent piece in the forthcoming DO volume about a Byzantine um, uh, astronomer, among other things, who goes to Tabriz and learns astronomy there and then brings it back and, and inserts his new knowledge into his uh, diagrams and manuscript codices. So I think the Byzantines were not, um, 
they were not North Korea. <laughs> they were they were open to their their neighbors, and I think they are a source of knowledge and also a also recipients of many kinds of knowledge that includes uh, diagram adjacent knowledge. Okay, thank you. And one very quick follow up question, if I may. I've become interested in recent years in in Western uh, art, Italian art particularly, in the di circular diagram of a labyrinth. Does that occur in medieval Byzantium as well? Uh, the 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 diagrams of um, Jericho are those the ones you mean? Well, I'm thinking of the one that uh, the one you may know is on the facade of Luca Cathedral. Oh, and of course the pavement of Shard Cathedral, things yes. like that. Yeah. They're also in, in manuscripts associated with the city of Jericho. So, so as an Old Testament uh, prototype, uh, we have those. Um, perhaps somebody who's listening can answer this question better. I have not explored those uh, uh, diagrams because as far as I know, they are only in books. And so at least for this work, I did not pursue that. Are okay. there monumental labyrinths in the Byzantine world? I don't know of any. That doesn't mean they're not there or that there may not be some bookish reference to them. D Divna, do you know? Divna has worked on, on labyrinths in, uh, in the um, Lambert of Saint-Omer, uh, but I don't remember you citing any Byzantine uh, com comparisons. Yeah, I was going to say that, yeah, I'm familiar with the kind of, you know, labyrinth and the Minotaur diagram, like in the Liber Flovitus, which was on the cover of one of Linda's uh, books. Um, but um, in for that particular work, I didn't find any Byzantine examples. And I, I was actually disappointed because I hoped I can make the parallel. I couldn't find examples in manuscripts. Yeah. Okay. okay. That, thank you. Thank you for, for affirming my answer. <laughs> Thanks. Now, Elisa Gallardi. Um, ciao, Linda. Hi, ciao. Ciao, piacere di vederti. Um, thank you so much for your lecture. That was very, very interesting. Uh, my question is about, I was just wondering if you see a difference uh, in the way in which uh, um, circular time, like the liturgical year, and, and the linear time, such as the passing of years, uh, is visualizing the diagrams. And uh, thinking about the passing of years, I was, because as you said, you know, the Byzantines were expecting that in the year 7,000, everything would end. If the, the idea that time is linear and is also finite, um, changes the way in which they visualize time, if, if, you, if they do. Thank you. I think that's a terrific question and I can't answer it because I don't, I don't have enough visual information to answer it. And it may be that I haven't done enough homework, although I usually do my homework very well. So I, I'm inclined to say that the evidence does not survive for a change at the end of time, let's say, uh, but it may just be something that I hadn't thought of and need to look, look more into. So thank you for that suggestion. I, I mean, there are circular diagrams and there are linear diagrams, but I, we can't infer that even if they both relate to time, for instance, the sundial has both lines and circles, but I, I don't think we can extrapolate from that um, uh, consistent format, any sense of, a, a, of changing time, nor do we have an early example and a late example of the same thing to compare. So I'm, I'm afraid that this is, I hope this is my least satisfactory answer of the of the evening. <laughs> Who knows? There may be more, but I'm afraid I can't answer that question. And, and I hope people will keep their eyes open for more evidence of diagrams, both spatial and and linear, and and run with that. Thank you, Elisa. Mi dispiace. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Anyways. Thank you. I cannot see. Any other question, neither on the chat nor uh, online? So I think before passing the torch to Professor uh, to Sir Zanja, thank you so much, Linda, for your wonderful talk. And I mean, looking forward to uh, to host another of your talk with further 
advancement in your research. You know, I, I actually yeah. want to say that uh, this material is uh, has been submitted for a Festschrift volume. I won't say whose. Uh, but I actually don't expect to work much more on diagrams. I had always envisioned my work as a sort of trinity of, of diagrams. Uh, so I'm encouraging anyone who's listening uh, and others to, to push this material farther. It's, it's, I'm not sure that I'm going to do it, but, um, but the positive feedback I've received today is of course very encouraging. So thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Linda. And well, it was very inspiring, very comprehensive. And I, I guess our audience also had a lot of now uh, impetus, research impetus, and uh, <laughs> they're excited uh, as well. Uh, I hope so. It was, it was a pleasure and honor to have you uh, among us and hope that we can come together with another different topic of yours. Uh, we are looking forward to your publications, the forthcoming ones. Uh, the books and journals, everything. And um, may I also um, make a quick reminder of the next topic, uh, which is also another interesting um, subject, spiritual landscapes and their afterlives, the Asiatic hinterland of Constantinople. Uh, this lecture will be on the 13th of May by uh, Alessandra Ricci of Koch University. So uh, we also hope that you'll be there and <laughs> Once again, thank you very much for uh, being with us. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure and a privilege as well. Thank you, Linda. Take care. Many greetings to Canada and hope uh, you get uh, warmer weather soon. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Okay.